Indeed, I'm very happy to present our uh, yeah, pre-registered report here. Um, and this is joint work with uh, Tine Taitelas and Guido van der Ren. And yeah, my name is uh, Tim Hess. So basically, this uh, presentation will have uh, two parts. First, I'm going to go a bit about the background and the motivation to our work. And then we arrive at the what and how perspectives. And then uh, in the second part of the presentation, I'm going to use these to basically go over recent on recent but literature in continual learning um, and basically project those onto these two perspectives until finally um, I'm trying to uh, yeah, render out our proposition on uh, how we aim to combine these both perspective perspectives and uh, what we hope the merits will be that we find. So yeah, just as a uh, word of precaution, I'm not going to use, uh, I'm not going to go into fundamentals of continual learning in the background, but given the venue, given the audience, I also think this is, won't be necessary. So let's uh, start at the core of our motivation, which is the stability gap, um, a phenomenon recently discovered by uh, Delang et al. And for people maybe not familiar with this, um, I'm going to go over what this means with a brief example, imagine you use a class incremental or you want to train continually class incremental split mini image net and you're going to use experience replay for your mitigation of forgetting. And then uh, you um, basically validate this uh, setup by looking at the performance of the first task that you have learned when continue learning the other tasks of this data set. What we typically find is you start with some uh, performance and then as you uh, add new tasks, train new tasks, you will gradually forget um, with each new encounter task with respect to the first task that you have learned. And I say gradually because if you look at this as a smaller resolution of performance measure, say every iteration, then this graph has to be found to look like this. So actually it's not gradual, but it's a rather drastic drop followed by a phase of recovery. Um, so the first question you could ask is why is this of concern? Ultimately, we do arrive at our um, performance as, as before. And to that, we can say, okay, um, for safety critical applications, at least you want to be aware of this. So it doesn't bite you in the end. Um, but even furthermore, this constant cycle of relearning seems quite wasteful and maybe we can do better. So I'm going to continue to give a little bit more intuition to uh, what's happening under the hood here. So staying in the example of uh, replay, we have our total loss or joint loss basically by two components, the loss on the newly observed data, and then the loss on the buffer that we're having. And um, taking the perspective of the gradients with respect to these losses, as Delange did as well, uh, we can basically say that we have one loss component, uh, one gradient component that is uh, responsible for the plasticity, trying to get the new information in from the new data. And then we have one part of the gradient that is trying to uh, maintain information that will be basically governing our stable part of the model. And if we look at the dynamics during training, how these interact, uh, when now, for example, you have trained one task, we call this the old task, we train a new task, um, then what we see is that the gradient magnitude of the stability are actually uh, yeah, in the first steps quite low because the model is already at a quite optimal state or near optimal state. In contrast, uh, potentially the plastic part will be quite high because there was a distribution shift, there's novel data that the mo uh, model has not seen before. So the magnitude is quite high and actually this loss is dominated by plasticity and we only optimize in direction of the plasticity, which yeah, then leads to this drop and then uh, only after some time when we have moved out enough, the stability starts to kick in, tries to regain the knowledge uh, that was lost until finally we get into an equilibrium state where you actually arrive at your, at your joint loss, right? Okay. So the first uh, question you can then ask is, okay, if we were to improve the approximation, right? If we have a bigger buffer, if we have a better selection of examples or otherwise improve the approximation to the joint loss, would that help? Um, oops, I'm sorry for that. <laughs> now we're going to work with this. So what we did is we have, uh, we studied this by saying basically, okay, alleviate the memory constraints. We're going to use an unlimited buffer um, and we balance the loss weighting such that every task will contribute equally to the loss function. 
And then we tested this in a domain incremental split cipher 100 setting. And what we found is this graph, which pretty much uh, looks like the last one, we found the stability gap persists. And so from this, we derive, okay, improving the approximation might not help with avoiding the stability gap alone, at least. Then the second question you can ask is, can the stability gap be even avoided at all, right? Because maybe your model is in a near optimum for the first task, but this is far away from optimal or from a better optimum with respect to all the tasks that you would want to train, all the data that you would want to train. And you need to forget maybe something. You need to escape this minimum by a transient phase of forgetting. Um, this could be a possibility. Um, however, there's evidence by uh, mode connectivity research, and especially linear mode connectivity research, uh, that leaves some doubt in that regard. And I'm going to explain this uh, based on these two schematics, um, where on the left side, we basically have a flow of how we would train the model. And on the right side, we depict the loss surfaces um, for the first task or the old task we've trained with respect to the new task that we want to train and with respect to what this would look like on the joint model. And this is based on work from uh, Kao et al. Um, so if we start uh, and train our first task, then we have a parameter configuration or old task. We have a parameter configuration that is near optimal for this task. And as we all know, if we then would just optimize towards the new task, we get into catastrophic forgetting. We move out of the vicinity uh, that was optimal for the first task and for the old task, and we move into a vicinity that is optimal for uh, any new task, but this is not necessarily uh, a joint optimum. However, if we train on the joint task uh, or on the joint, jointly on the data together, what linear mode connectivity tells us is that there would have been a path you can take such that you actually arrive at the joint optimum, not leave the uh, low loss region for the old task. And because it's joint, it's then also optimal or near optimal for new data. But apparently we are not taking this path because what we experience is the stability gap. And uh, yeah, what we can uh, from the schematic, schematic, one reason for that would be, okay, this low loss region is not necessarily the gradient, the steepest gradient and taking the steepest gradient um, with respect then also to the uh, new data would lead you transiently outside of this low loss vicinity. So the good news is it should be possible to avoid the stability gap, right? If we could only uh, follow this low loss path region. And um, so the, the two perspectives we, we find is that we need to have, we need to care about where we optimize towards, but we also need to care about how we are optimizing towards this joint loss. And with that, I'm going to um, put this now basically in the uh, perspective of um, yeah, previous uh, continual learning approaches before then going to our proof of concept of uh, yeah, that we plan to do for combining both perspectives. So the three sets I'm going to talk about is regularization and replay, model expansion parameter isolation, and then gradient pro projection. Starting with regularization and replay, we in the previous examples, we already covered this to some extent, at least for replay. Um, and, but regularization basically has the same objective, uh, which is to better approximate the joint loss. So we have our entire model and we allow changes to our entire model. And we say, if we have a very good um, approximate to what uh, a joint optimum, yeah, a loss that governs a joint optimum, if we can optimize towards that, then we uh, basically solve catastrophic forgetting. However, as detailed before, this alone is not addressing the stability gap. It's an important part though. Then the second point we have is model expansion and parameter isolation. And this is an interesting one because it's a way to avoid the stability gap. Why? Because what we are under the hood doing is we are typically freezing some part of the model. Um, either we add new modules uh, then to maintain plasticity or we find paths in the model that are especially um, yeah, predictive or produce uh, the responses for certain tasks. And if we freeze those, we prevent forgetting. And if we have no forgetting, we have no stability gap. Um, of course, this comes with some downsides. You have to uh, potentially infer task identity and you're limiting your positive transfer because you have frozen parts in your model now. Um, but even more so, if you avoid the instability gap entirely, then there's not really a point in, in uh, yeah, mitigating it. Uh, so this is kind of a, yeah, a separate part. Um, and there are scenarios where you actually 
cannot really do this, such as in domain incremental settings where you, yeah, where this may not be the best approach to take. And then the last set is uh, gradient projection. And in gradient projection, I again have to make a distinction. Um, first, there's orthogonal gradient projection, and um, this works in the following way. So um, what it aims to do is um, to find out the, um, the subspaces of input to basically uh, yeah, formulate the mapping that is uh, that was found for previous tasks in the model, and then protect these mappings by saying, OK, new updates, new gradient updates to this model can only happen in directions that are orthogonal to um, to these spaces that were already found. And in the math here, we can uh, see this quite clearly. You basically erase the direction of, of previous, of, uh, that are occupied by previous spaces and are only left with the remaining part of that space. Um, and so basically, this is another form of formulation of parameter isolation. Um, it could work beautifully, but uh, again, yeah, we're not uh, yeah, as, as, as keen in this direction. However, there's also a second, um, a second way of how you could do this. And uh, this was neatly explained by a gradient episodic memories. Um, and here the idea is, uh, again, OK, we want to optimize the, the loss on the new data, but we want to do it in such a way that the loss on the old task does not increase. And especially, we're going to do it in such a way that positive backward transfer is possible by, um, uh, yeah, here the authors found the, const uh, for example, this constraint here, uh, which basically says, OK, if you, um, if you have an angle of less than 90 degrees, or in other words, if you have a cosine similarity above zero, then actually it's, it should be safe to apply this gradient, and uh, this could benefit the previous task. And this actually looks like a suitable mechanism to alter the optimization trajectory, as we have been searching for. However, uh, it's uh, in this version, or in its original formulation, it was posed as an alternative to uh, changing the loss, as we have discussed before, especially with uh, referring to replay, um, where the idea was, OK, if, you, if your memory buffer is just too small and the approximation is just too bad, then uh, maybe you should do something like this. Uh, and so what they uh, but then did is exclusively optimized towards the uh, the loss of the new task and then hope for the uh, for the um, adjustment of the trajectory to push it to a, a global optimum. Okay. Um, so with all of this in mind, uh, let's come back to the two perspectives. Uh, we want to optimize the joint objective and we want to care about how uh, we do that, how we uh, how the trajectory looks like. And uh, basically, towards our proof of concept, what uh, we want to do is we want to say, OK, uh, replay is, is a very neat way of optimizing your joint objective, because you can basically choose how well you want to optimize it. If you want to fully, uh, if you want to have uh, basically full approximation, restoring everything, if you have, want to have like a, a yeah, more relaxed approximation, basically. And then the second thing we have is gem updates, gems update routine for adjusting the optimization trajectory. And what we hope to uh, then show is that something happens like on the uh, part on the right here, that you push the trajectory towards uh, this low loss region, which lies in the vicinity of the first task. OK. Um, Throughout the experimentation, we want to check this for uh, domain incremental and class incremental data sets based on Cypher 100 mini image net and also rotated MNIST. Um, we want to see it for offline settings and online settings because it will be applicable for both. And the architectures we're going to use are mainly, uh, yeah, will be based on a reduced ResNet version or MLP in case of MNIST. And this is as much as, uh, as brief as I'm going to be here because I kind of lost track of time. Um, and then, yeah, to, to wrap up basically here is, uh, yeah, next to improving the objective we want to optimize, which is certainly an important part, we also want to be careful about how we arrive at the optimum for the sake of the stability gap. And we hope that throughout the experimentation, we can corroborate the merit of combining these two perspectives, the what to optimize, the how to optimize it, and, um, yeah, to show that uh, this can be a, a prospering perspective for uh, continual learning. So with that, I have nothing left than to uh, thank the organizers, uh, thank everybody in the audience. And if there are any questions, I'd be open. Great, thank you.